The Susan Brinder Show is a radio show online broadcasted on YouTube across the United States and globally. The show features guests who speak about health, spirituality, entertainment, and a host of subjects to enlighten people across the nation. Listen to the show that empowers women and men alike and highlights those who have made a difference. I'm Susan Brinder, and this is the show for the love of dogs, and I'm so pleased to have somebody who has done so much work as a trainer for dogs, and his name is Dylan Mitchell. Dylan Mitchell is the owner, the founder, the head trainer, discovered his passion and a gift for caring for animals when he got his first dog, Star. And this happened at the age of seven. Star was a German Shepherd, and years later, while Dylan was living in Los Angeles, working in music, he found himself missing something, and the selfless companionship of dogs. And that is what we are going to be talking about today, interaction with dogs, and all the reasons why people, and I'm talking about a lot of people, have dogs. And you know what, Dylan? There are people who are doing training, but you are really unique in many ways, as I've been told. And I just want to know what sets you apart from other trainers. Hi, Susan. Uh, thanks for having me on here today. Uh, I think what sets us apart from other trainers is that, you know, and, and we're not totally separate. Like there's what I'm doing is not anything, you know, out of the ordinary as far as dog training goes. But the results that we're getting are, are much different than other dog training companies. And I, and I have to give credit where credit's due. And, you know, I, I was meant, I'm mentored by a guy named Mike Lorraine. And uh, he taught me, like, reward space training, basically, versus balance training. Um, and the, I'll go into the difference of those two training methods later down the road. But basically what it, what it happens is when a dog comes in to our program, you know, some are confident, some are not confident, some love food, some don't love food. And so we use, you know, the three pillars of dog training and and with a heavy influence on reward-based training to get the results. So everything that dog does has either a positive or a negative consequence. Positive Mm -hmm. consequence meaning the dog gets food. Uh, negative consequence means the dog gets some form of positive punishment, which is something that the dog does not like. Um, negative punishment is withholding something that the dog likes. So we use, you know, negative and positive and operant and classical conditioning through rewards-based training. Yeah. You know, Dylan, you're an entrepreneur and dog training has been proven, I, I guess, and I'm making an assumption here, that it's proven to be very lucrative. And when you started, what was your expectations? Um, well, I mean, as far as lucrative goes, it's, it's all relative, really. You know, I, I spent over, you know, like $20,000 to go to dog training school. Um, and then afterwards, I, I went and worked for a, a huge pro. Uh, and I made like 10 or 12, like I started at 10 bucks an hour and then got moved up to 12 bucks an hour. And there was 130 dogs in the kennel at a time. Um, so I started from nothing and, and I built this from nothing. And, you know, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to be exactly where I am now. Uh, we do charge, you know, like $1,200 a week for our board and train. And, Fantastic. You know, that is really incredible because, you know, so many people, really love their animals and when somebody like yourself takes care of them and teaches them all different ways in which they could be really a good support animal if you will that's fantastic now let's talk about gunner you know he was a very energetic german shepherd who entered your life and in he worked with multiple trainers in the Los Angeles area for three years to build a strong foundation of obedience and protection. Now, Dylan found that training dogs was calling, it was his calling in life. When you say calling in life, uh, Dylan, what do you mean by that? So I was, I was working in Los Angeles and um, I was working in the entertainment field doing creative direction and artist management. And I've always been a dog person. I've always had dogs, but I didn't have a dog of my own. And so I, I decided I was going to get a German Shepherd again. And I wanted to get into some dog sports, but I, I had no idea what I was doing or how to even get there. Long story short, I found the German Shepherd. I named him Gunner. 
Um, and we began training to compete uh, in, in a sport called Schutzen, which is now called IGP. Um, mm -hmm. It used to back in, you know, way back when, hundreds of years ago, it was the, the German Shepherd breed survey uh, for, for law enforcement dogs over in Europe. And, you know, now it's, it, there's obviously it's, it's a world known thing. Um, but anyways, calling in life, I would say that, you know, I quit everything to do what I was doing. Um, I was not broke. I was not hurting for anything. I had everything that I thought I wanted and needed. And I decided to walk away from it all and go to a dog trainer school of all things. Wow. So, you know, oh, yeah. that's the truth. Um, I, like I said, I was living in Malibu at the time and coming from where I come from, you know, to, to be able to make it to Malibu on your own is, you know, was, was pretty big and pretty cool in my eyes. And when I, when I got there and I was, you know, had my own place to live and, you know, a studio and, you know, the artists were doing great and, you know, we were doing shows and flying around the country and blah, 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 blah. You know, you, I, I, for, for years, you know, that was all that I wanted to do. And I did that. And I said, you know, I, I, I just really miss hanging out with a dog. <laughs> so yeah. that's, uh, that was kind of like, you know, I, I never woke up one day and said, I want to be a dog trainer. It wasn't like my aspiring goals as a kid was to be a veterinarian or a dog trainer. That was never my story. That was never my case. Um, I was able to achieve, you know, all the things that I had thought I dreamed of doing and, and check those off the list. And then I was like, all right, so now what? And what had happened was I got Gunner. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed training. It was a challenge. I loved challenges. And then I got a female and the female I ended up training as well. And then I ended up breeding her. And then once she had puppies, I sold all the puppies and the people that I dealt with were just extremely genuine, loving people. And it was kind of like a really nice brush of fresh air. That's uh, fantastic. L uh, let me ask you something. Let me interrupt you for a second. Now, you participated in all phases of training and client interaction. Um, could you explain to our audience when you talk about all phases of training, what are the phases? Explain that to our audience because I want them to understand what training is all about by somebody who really knows what he's doing. So there's different temperaments in dogs. Um, you have, you know, your general basic puppy stuff, which is teaching a dog its name, teaching a dog to walk on a leash, teaching a dog to come, uh, teaching a dog place command, a sit command, a down command. But then you have dogs that you know, need behavior modification, or you have dogs that are being going to be sold to the Department of Defense for detection work, or you have dogs that are going to be, you know, a service dog, or you have dogs that are going to be just a super well-trained pet that don't have any behavioral issues, but they're different than a puppy. Um, and, you know, each dog requires different things. None of them are the same, but the science behind them and, and how we get there is the same. Yeah. Uh, all dogs can work for their food. And as far as the phases go is, you know, you have a day one dog and then you have a dog that you've had for three weeks. And so what you do is the, the end goal is the same, but how you get there is different. Yeah. Um, years ago, Dylan, I did an interview with somebody from the Westminster uh, show. And um, it's amazing how much money people spend on dogs to just let them you know, be part of a competition. Have you ever had somebody uh, that you've been dealing with who put their dogs at the Westminster show? And if so, what was that like? So I have no background in confirmation showing dogs, which is what West Westminster is. They're all like dogs that are models, quote unquote. Um, the dogs that I've dealt with, while some of my clients are interested in showing their dog, um, most of my background from prior to being a pet trainer was with the working breed. So I like an, the analogy of I was training soldiers and to do a job and the Westminster thing is more of like uh, breeding models, so to say. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I like to support reputable breeders. Um, I also like adopting dogs and training them. Like if it was up to me, I, I could go and I could have a really well-bred dog and compete at the highest level with it. But I could also go and find a well-bred dog that 
was surrendered because the owners didn't know what they were doing and is now sitting at the shelter and just needs the right trainer to bring out its full potential. Yeah. You know, Dylan, there are people who are blind to use dogs and they're amazing what these dogs do for people who have, you know, obstacles or, um, you know, illnesses or different disabilities so that they can, you know, get along in society and do what they want to do. Um, do you work with them in a different kind of way that you would ordinarily work with somebody who just has a pet, a pet dog? Um, it just depends. If it's a specific service dog, yeah, of course. You know, an emotional support dog is different, though. An emotional support dog can behave however it wants. It's just a letter from a doctor saying that it's an emotional support dog, that, that the client has a mental or emotional illness, and this dog makes that person better. Mm -hmm. A service dog is totally different, though. A service dog is a dog that is, you know, federally, by law, it's, it's trained to perform three specific jobs or tasks. So you have something like, you know, mobility or light switches or blood pressure or, you know, uh, retrieving a medicine bottle or quadriplegics and paraplegics. These are people that, you know, a, a seeing eye dog for sure. These are people that depend on their dog for their everyday life. And uh, currently I don't have any seeing eye dogs, but what I do have is I'm training a dog for a 17 year old adolescent girl with RTS syndrome. And what RTS syndrome from what I've understood is it's a girl that's, it's a person that is like, you know, X amount of age, age years old mm -hmm. and emotionally they're like 15 or 20 years behind from what they are physically. So this girl's, you know, 17 years old, she's getting ready to be 18, but emotionally and mentally she's like a six year old. Wow. So her parents contacted uh, me and, and I've sourced them a dog, a black lab. And he's currently going through training right now. And, and they're getting ready to have their first time with the dog since meeting. Um, like the first during the week of Christmas will be their first visit after four weeks of training. And then the dog will come back for another six weeks of training. And then again, after that, then we'll begin the service dog training task. That's an amazing thing to help people like that, help the disabled, um, whether they're mentally disabled or physically disabled. But what I want to also know is that you see people coming on the airplane with uh, support dogs, and I, I forget what they, the, um, the clothes that they wear or the, the little thing that's on their back. Um, and you know, you look at these people and you say, they don't have a disability, they don't have a problem, but they need a support dog. Why would they need that? How do you feel about that? Um, I think it's a shame, really. You know, I think people that call emotional support dogs, service dogs, one, they're either uneducated or two, they're just rude. Um, and the reason it, it, like, it bothers me is because the person that really does need a service dog when they have some goofy person with an emotional support dog calling it a service dog, and it's clearly not a service dog, you're giving kind of like a bad rap to the person that does need an actual service dog. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, I hear you. They can't and that differentiate between whether that person really needs a service dog or or an emotional, or that's an emotional support dog trying to be a service dog. Yeah, yeah. Now, Dylan, what type of programs do you think clients would benefit mostly from? Because there must be different things that you offer that really give people an understanding of what their dogs need and what they need. Um, what, what do you think of the programs that, that you think really work? So I'm a big believer in, you know, show me, like, uh, you know, a lot of people, some people, oh, well, he's had four more training and da 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 And I said, okay, you know, show me. And if they can show me, great. Then maybe they're suitable for private lessons and they just need like a little tweaking and some problem solving, or maybe they want to be, they want to be super involved with dog training. Uh, so they're like a good candidate for private lessons. But I would say nine out of 10 people and their dog, they could definitely benefit the most from a board and train where it's like the dog lives with us as one of our own and is trained multiple times a day. Um, and the reason the boarding train is so effective is because typically in half hour, in, in private lessons, you only get to see the dog for a half hour or an hour. Um, and then in the boarding train, 
you're able to, to access the dog as much as you need to. So as when the dog's ready to train, you have it right there. You're able to train it. Uh, yeah. and those time periods, they start at two weeks and they go up until six, six, seven, eight weeks old. Dogs yeah. that are severely aggressive or like severely scared and skittish, they require a more six to eight week program. The general, just general obedience training on like a normal puppy or a normal dog, confident one that likes food and is food motivated. That's more of a, you know, two to three week program. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, when dogs go to nursing homes or they go to uh, assisted living homes, the people, they just come alive. You know, sometimes they have Alzheimer's or dementia. And of course, you see them sitting in chairs with their head down and sad and all of those other things that kind of contribute to their dementia or to their Alzheimer's. But when you bring a dog in, then it all changes. Explain that to me. Have you experienced working in nursing homes or, or bringing your dogs to these kinds of facilities? So I personally have not. I do have a couple clients that have achieved their canine good citizen and are working towards having their dog become a therapy dog, if that makes sense. And a therapy dog is what a dog that is allowed to go into a nursing home and hospitals and stuff like that. So what we do is we get a dog in for general obedience training. If they have the hopes and dreams of one day becoming a therapy dog, then we start with basic obedience. That program is the same as every general obedience course that we offer. So we do introductions to everything. We do all the general obedience training. And then at the end of the stay, we do a mock canine good citizen test to see what the dog still needs work on and how it is we can help them. Mm, that's interesting. Now, you know, you actually have worked with over 100 pet dogs. You raise them, you sold to Black Labs, to the Department of Defense. Now, that's an interesting thing because when you go to the airport and you see these dogs that are sniffing for drugs, wow, that is, I mean, really a way to kind of get rid of this problem. Now, do you ever train those kinds of dogs as well? Yeah, so it's not just drugs. It's uh, also, you know, explosives and firearms and things of that nature. Um, you have to be licensed to actually get the scents and stuff of that nature, like the actual narcotics. Uh, so what we do is we get, I, I have purchased puppies at eight weeks of age, raised the puppies until they're 10 months of age, doing all their environmental stuff, teaching them how to hunt and how to use their nose and so on and so forth to develop them so that they, when they're at 10, 10 months of age, they're able to go on and go ahead and learn their training for their specific job and task. What, what's in the future for you, Dylan? Um, is there something else that you want to do uh, with dogs? Uh, perhaps there's a, something out there that needs the companionship of a dog. Do you see yourself doing something else or inventing some other technique? What do you see happening? Well, yeah, I, I don't want to speak too soon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, why not? I, I definitely, you know, I definitely. So there's a thing called, you know, equine therapy. Um, and I would love to, to get a, like a dog therapy kind of program going um, and, and more work with obviously struggling adolescents and kids with, you know, emotional and mental and, and physical limitations and getting them around dogs and, you know, kind of like rehabbing them through dog training in a sense. Mm -hmm. So there's equine assisted therapy and I would like to do canine assisted therapy, uh, especially down here in the Southeast Florida area. Uh, I think it could be super beneficial and super effective. And I think it could really change some lives. And, you know, that's really my goal in life is to make a difference. And if I can do that through dogs, uh, then, you know, I'm living my dream for sure. Uh, no. And I think as far as where we are now, you know, we're, we're, we're specifically not a kennel. We are a kennel in a home. And, you know, dogs are trained for homes and they need to perform well in people's homes. And I think that's really important. So what I, I would ultimately love is if I were able to get, you know, five, 10, 15 acres here in Southeast Florida somewhere, mm -hmm. and then build like more homes on that land so that we could train more dogs in a sense. Like right now our capacity is limited to like, you know, 10 dogs. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to be able to have 10 dogs in each home on the property and, you know, kind of have like a, uh, and, you know, have 
kind of like a community where it's people come there for therapy. They can also have their dogs trained. You know, there's outdoor activities for the people to do as well with their dogs, agility, dock diving, you know, things of that nature. That's fantastic. Um, what a helpful thing that would be to our society to start a program like you're talking about. Now, I always like to give my guests the last word. What would you like to tell our audience? Um, just that, you know, having a trained dog with the proper tools and communication, you know, I've, I've seen it literally save lives. Um, if you're considering getting a dog, whether you have it trained by me or by someone else, that's not important. But for sure, definitely have the dog trained. And I mean, it'll totally enhance your relationship with the dog and it'll totally enhance your life in general. And if people want to get in touch with you to find out your, about your programs, um, to get in touch to see whether they could bring their dog to you, how do they do that? They can call us. Uh, it's 561-289-1713. They can also send us a text message. They can go on our website, fullpotentialcanine.com. That's www.fullpotentialcanine.com. P O T as in Tom, E is in elephant, N is in Nancy, T I A L, the letter K, the number nine, dot com. Well, our guest today has been. Uh, Dylan Mitchell, who is the owner, the founder, and the head trainer of a program here in South Florida, and he's discovered his passion. And boy, when you discover your passion, there's nothing better than that. So I want to thank you, Dylan, for being on The Love of Dogs, and stay tuned for the next program for The Love of Dogs, because we have so much to teach you and so much to tell you. Thank you again, Dylan. No problem.